was hoping to give you. Yeah. Wanted to give you a little um, background on myself, and then um, yeah. you know, it's really cool to see uh, your enthusiasm here because I'm one of the older heads uh, who's been around the block a little bit, but it's not dissimilar to what we were trying to do um, years ago. There was a blog called The Offside, and this is around 2006, 2007, just after Italy had won the World Cup. It was a website that was a blog site that was dedicated to football across all of Europe. And Serie A would have its own dedicated landing page. And basically every club in Serie A at the time, they were looking for a writer or two to continually write about um, uh, the, that specific club. So, you know, back when I was your age, it was something that Yes, I was very interested in doing um, something that, that I was doing a lot of freelance writing on the side. And um, basically myself and another person, Stephen Van, Van Dice from Belgium, we were co-bloggers of this Palermo, uh, right. uh, the offside site. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, after, after a while, the offsides kind of like, I mean, they really were focused on the big clubs. That's where... It, Okay. traffic and the click rates and whatnot but um i had an idea to start my own website and it was similar to um your your intentions here anthony and it was like i wanted to provide english speaking folks an outlet for palermo which at the time in the mid to mid to late 2000s you know was the heyday it was the glory day of, of uh, the Rosanero and just giving them the opportunity to read news in English without having to trawl through Italian if they didn't know Italian. Yeah. Um, and then as well as, you know, people who weren't even Italian, but were finding an interest to this club that oh, seemed yeah. to be popping ar around Europe and whatnot. So started the website Ultra Palermo and we did, you know, a lot of the same things that we were doing uh, via that, the blogosphere with match reports and, um, yeah. news and opinion pieces and whatnot. Um, now, I have family, just like you, I have family in Sicily myself, and about every year, uh, I take the opportunity to go visit them, and uh, they live outside of Palermo in two communes, in Bagaria and, and, and Aspra. Uh, really? Some other Bagaria relatives in Porticello, yeah. yeah so, wow. so it's just a plane ticket real nice for me to get over there, see the family, hang out for a bit. And through a lot of these endeavors, I actually met a lot of people via Twitter that um, would become actually real life friends. So one of those was a journalist in, in Italy, in Sicily, actually, and he writes for Giornale di Sicilia, uh, and his name is Benedetto uh, Giardina. And I've had the privilege of meeting him face to face a couple of times. And, you know, when I get a chance to go out there, I'll, I'll hit him up. We talk over WhatsApp all the time. But he also was able to get me in at the club. So, man, this is probably 2013. I was able to attend a press conference and, you know, meet the coach and, and the GM at the time or the DS at the time. Um, and then some of the folks who are on staff and, and they've, you know, obviously it's a lot different now, but yeah. um, through – through Benedetto or Benny, as he goes by on Twitter, right. um, you know, I've had a little bit of that inside track. Um, but yeah, Twitter opens a lot of doors. It's cool that, you know, you're using it in that fashion. The other thing I would say, I wrote for uh, Football Italia for, yeah, uh, for a while. Uh, for, yeah. yeah, both for their web and for their print, because they had a couple of print uh, okay. uh, opportunities. So now I'm a little older and um, I've mainly stuck to just the Twitter account um, and, you know, maintaining that following and providing people those updates there, yeah. which is another reason why I think it's so cool that you've taken that focus, expanded it to, you know, a lot further than, um, you know, even what some of these other websites are doing where, yeah, Serie D, you got it covered. Excellenza, you got it covered. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, uh, it, it's, it's pretty cool to see. So kudos on that, I would say. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, well, because um, the interesting thing about Sicily, and I mean, this probably applies to all of Italy, but Sicily, like, you go to every town, they'll have their own club. And I mean, you know, you look at Palermo supporters, they 
on maybe another, you know, on a Sunday or a Saturday, they'll have their, their really local team, like obviously like, Bar, you know, Bagaria or um, the likes of, you know, Carini as well, you know. They'll, they they play in the fifth or sixth division and then they'll support Palermo, you know, the following, you know, night or something. So it's really amazing to see. And right. it intrigues me, like, you know, um, just, you know, how in Sicily each town has their own clubs, which is really fascinating. Yeah, and yeah it's very huge over there as well. So, um, yeah, so obviously um, we'll talk a bit about... Uh, Palermo this season, probably a bit of the history too. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think you did a podcast not long ago with a, a journalist called Nima. Nima. Nima, so. Okay. Yeah, and you're talking so, about some Perini days and something about some emails. Oh boy. Okay, so Nima, Nima yeah. is another one of those old heads from the mid to late 2000s um, into the early. 2010s in which there was a lot of us who kind of knew uh, about one another we were kind of doing similar things and then through twitter twitter was a great unifying place for all to not yeah. just banter but also get to know each other so <clears throat> because of my connections with the club and the fact that this goes you know predates just the explosion onto the scene of all these different blogs and whatnot um Via the the Twitter account that I had, I came across a lot of these these people that I, I really would never have met. And so I already gave you a heads up. Benny yeah. was one who, um, he and I would talk outside. We'd talk via WhatsApp. Uh, you know, I'd meet him when we were in Sicily. But I got to, to have some more connections there because this guy was a credential journalist writing for the biggest paper in Sicily, yeah. the Giornale di Sicilia. Yeah. And not only that, he was on the sports beat. So he would meet with the press and, and whatnot. Nevertheless, uh, there was one year, there was an infamous year. I mean, they're all infamous under Zamparini, but there was that yeah. one year where we had more coaching changes than wins. Yes. And we even were approaching... Um, I mean, it was really frustrating because we had a squad that was good enough not to be fighting for relegation, but because of, of where we were, um, it was a constant struggle. And every week Zamparini would try to shift things up or, or shake things up, I should say. So I had Maurizio Zamparini's email. Oh, okay. And one night, I, I never thought, anything about the fact that I did have his email. Um, I should say this. I also wrote, I also did English translation for one of the largest Palermo fan pages, or it, it's, it's a media site in Sicily as well. So you have two major okay. um, pseudo news organizations over there. They have their own press credentials and whatnot. You have Stadio News and you have Media Gold. Yeah, so, Medigo, one of the bigger ones. So, yeah. yeah, so so Media Goal, I actually knew the owner there, and I would help translate um, articles that they wrote in Italian, both news and opinion pieces, into English yeah. for him. So I can't remember how I managed to get Zampanini's email, but the point is I had it, and I was really frustrated um, one afternoon after watching you know, another performance that we kind of shot ourselves in the foot. And I know Zamparini was kind of going a little crazy in his post-match thoughts and just what he was going to do. Yeah. So I decided to open up my email and write an email. So I, I, I wrote him a letter. It's in Italian. I wrote him a letter. I hit send on it. And basically it was the, the, the contents of my, my email were fairly simple. I said, look, I'm a nobody. I'm just a fan. Yeah. I love our team. I'll follow us even if we get relegated from Serie A to Serie B. But I really think that the disruptions are creating problems. And if we just let this team focus, even with the same manager, yeah. you will get results. And I sent it, right? Didn't think anything of it. And little yeah. did I know that it was something like nine hours later. I remember this because I was going on vacation the next morning. So I had to wake up early for a flight okay. and I opened up my email and I looked and I saw a response from 
the email that I had sent. Did you so, ever think he would reply? No, not 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 in in the world. Would it's I, one of those things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. You just I I sent it. I was like, look, I got that off my chest. Whatever. Maybe somebody on his staff will will see it or whatnot. But of course, knowing what we know about Zamparini, of course he's checking his personal email, and of course he would take the time not to just read it, but to respond to it. And it was how he responded that was hilarious. He literally yeah. gave me a bulleted breakdown. I think it was from, like he started at point A and he went to like point J as to why this was not really his fault and as to whose fault it was. And basically it was an airing of grievances on his part to me, some random fan that had just wrote him a, a, an email. And so um, this was a story that got out and, and Nima heard about it. And they, for the longest time, were trying to press me to release the contents of this email. Right. And this goes back years. Uh, Anthony, this goes back years that they would try to get me to release this. And I said, you know what, here, here is when I'll release it. When Zamparini finally sells the club or he's no longer in the picture, I'll release the, the emails oh. and I'll let everybody know what he sent. So obviously what happened a couple of years ago, we know what happened and yeah. um, it kind of went uh, a little viral there because I did release the um, uh, the original email, then a loose translation um, uh, from his response. And, and I think the best part of all of this was that it was a very lengthy email. I'm not kidding. It was a fairly lengthy oh, email. And then, little document there. Yeah. And, and at the end, it shows that was in the other iPad. So he literally typed this thing up from his iPad and just fired it away right back at me. So yeah. I could see this guy just angrily hunting and pecking and give me a response but not only that not only did he respond to me he also was like making some very wild comparisons based on the players that we had on our disposal and why they were either if not the equivalent of folks at Roma because he believed that we should be playing a Roma style uh, in both our formation and our mentality and he would compare different players to that but not only that, he was botching his own players' last names. Like sometimes they weren't even close, yeah. uh, which was just really hilarious. So beyond that, I think that that was a moment where um, Nima to this day has uh, um, a field day with it because anytime he can bring it up, he'll allude to it. And he's, he's very involved. He's got several podcasts and whatnot, but every once in a while, if, if, if Zamparini creeps up, well, you know, yeah, he goes absolutely. back to that, that, that email. So what a character Zamparini was. And absolutely. I mean, you know, we can look at, you know, the signings that, you know, under his um, uh, name, you know, when they, they make good signings like Dybala or we're talking about Vasquez or, you know, the likes of, going back even further but I mean and then you had you know he's he was known for you know all these things with the controversy of coaches and changing them as quick as you know scoring goals um and you know it's just you know weird to see how he even got good signings and then you know he had all his coaching problems and then we talk about stuff like real controversial problems in you know, like, you know, that dodginess and money, uh, financial um, issues that occur in behind the scenes. Yeah. And this is a regular pattern with uh, like a lot of uh, Sicilian teams, even Italian teams on the mainland. But um, it's obviously what's happening to Catania now. But um, we'll t yeah. you know, when um, Palermo got, uh, well, when they went bankrupt, you know, um, you know a little bit more about, you know, behind the scenes in there or? Yeah, so that, that period was chaotic, to mm -hmm. say the least. And no. so um, there was a lot of warning signs prior to the final death bell or the death blow, however you want to look at it. Yeah. Um, I could go very deep. I'll try to keep it fairly high level. But the thing with Zamparini was, you know, it was like one of those situations where it was the best of times, but not always the worst of times until the very end. Um, obviously, when 
Zamparini owned Venezia. He left Venezia under very auspicious circumstances. And, you know, to this day, the folks in Venezia do not look at him very kindly. But when he came in and he bought Palermo, he was buying a a, a club that was yo-yoing between Serie B and Serie C and a lot more in Serie C than Serie B. And he bought them. And within two years, we were promoted to Serie A. And he did bring a lot of stability to the club at the time because in 2003, 2004, you know, the financial weight that he had um, was very good for a club of our, our stature. And so those early years were phenomenal under, under uh, Guidoline and, you know, a lot of the marquee signings that were made that were, yeah. um, that, that turned out to be just uh, providential. So, you know, we mentioned the, the likes of uh, Dybala and Vazquez and, um, you know, a lot of those players were towards the end, but not necessarily at the end. But um, early on, there was some very shrewd, some very good business dealings that he was doing. And, and it's a pattern that we have seen be successful in Italy uh, in the top flight as a whole um, mm-hmm. for the type of mid-level club. So those types of clubs who have very big um, dreams or goals to try to make to the Champions League and, and, and whatnot, but it's they have to manage their budget well. They have to be able to find those signings who aren't household stars, but they get the opportunity to play on a like bigger up, stage. Up. Yes, yes. And so that success, you see Udinese from that time. Yeah. But Palermo was the precursor to even, you know, the, the Atalanta to, of today. I look at well, yeah. Atalanta with some, some jealousy because it's like this is what Palermo should have been exactly. with a little bit more stability, right? Gasparini was a coach at Palermo, believe yeah. it or not. Uh, when Mikoli and, and Sorrentino were there, I remember this well. So, side note, by the way, the chaos with the, the managers. I was, I'm also well known for having a spreadsheet, a very detailed spreadsheet that has documented each coach, how long they lasted, both in calendar days and match days, what their record is, goals for, goals against, all of that. So, um, under Zamparini. So, I have a very detailed list and yeah. uh, accounting of, of all that. So that being said, towards the end, the reality was this. Palermo was losing money. They were making gambles on players that were not always panning out. And so for every Dybala, there is going to be others that just are washed out. And you're spending, maybe it's not exorbitant sums, but it's enough that you get a slew of these and you could be in real trouble if the results on the field uh, uh, or on the pitch are not um, congruent to what you're spending. And so in 2013, 2014, right after that amazing Coppa Italia semifinal uh, against Inter, Inter. The, where, where we lost in the Stadio Olimpico. Yeah, um, there's a lot of Palermo. Right things. after yeah. that, the yeah, there, there were. Amazing, you know. And it was it was basically the beginning of the end uh, mm-hmm. of that successful era because it was after that that well Mikuli was not returning there was a lot that 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 club kind of went in um, a different direction now it wasn't the complete end because even though they were relegated shortly after maybe a season or two after that they bounced right back up yeah. and even then you're like okay for a lot of these clubs, you can survive that first year, maybe even a second year in Serie B. But after that, it becomes a lot tougher. Uh, and, and we know this, we see this, and it just becomes even increasingly more difficult in Serie C, Serie D, um, et cetera. So towards the end, what we were starting to find out was that uh, Benny Giardina was doing great work, by the way, uh, for Giordano di Sicilia in um, looking into the financials here, and things were not adding up. Um, the club had a 40 million euro debt that they would have to cover, and that's a it lot. Wasn't looking, for a team. Yes, yes, it no. is. And and um, Zamparini was trying to find different ways of covering. So 
towards the very end, he was looking for new owners and it got wild here in, in, um, uh, in those last two years. And so on the one hand, he was like, look, I found us a deal with this company that's covering our marketing right. and they wrote us a check for 40 million euro. I was like, well, that's very nice. That's interesting. Very generous, eh? Yeah, very generous. And it turns out that long story short, that was a holding company yeah. that was under Zamparini. Um, that was registered, I think, in, in Luxembourg or something like that. Yeah. So it was one yeah, of those, you know, yeah, it, yeah it's, a, it's a shell game here. So that being said, Palermo now found themselves in Serie B, but they were doing well in Serie B. Yeah. The previous year, they had just missed out on promotion by an infamous match with two-legged tie with uh, Frosinone. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was uh, the ball on the pitch. In, uh, the balls were on the thrown on the pitch yeah. and, and, and whatnot. So the following year, uh, it was back to the drawing board. Palermo was going to look for, Zamparino was going to look for new owners. He found this British group. Yeah. And this British group came in in November of that year. And um, they came in and took over the, uh, the, the club. And at the time, our, our sporting director was looking for that legendary yeah. old Palermo Rino Foschi. Yeah. He was looking into um, the uh, actually, it was Giorgio Paranetti looking into um, the dealings here. And we were coming up on some payments that had to be made for wage payments for our players and whatnot. And this British group was never really showing that they actually had legitimate funds. Yeah. So they were showing a bunch of um, holding companies that really, the, 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 the timestamps on them, the bait, bait marks there, not a lot of cash being put into them. And they were recently uh, incorporated. So yeah. a lot of this was very shaky. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we went back to them and demanded that they sell the club back to our sporting director right. so that they could not get hit with a point deduction, which at the time, now this is into January, February, Palermo's near the, the top of the Serie B table. They're not in the top, but they're near the top. And they were top especially the looking for the up top and Lecce hanging around there as yeah. well. Right. And, and they were looking for that, you know, that second spot. And so yeah. any point deduction would be hugely detrimental to their pursuit of making it back to Serie A. So those British individuals did, they sold the club back to our sporting director. And this is when our current ownership makes a foray into the picture. So at the time, we did not have the funds on hand to cover some wage payments for a couple months. And Dario Miri, who is a local businessman, came in and offered up five million of his own money to um, pay those pay those costs. And he did. And and there were some there were some deals around that what that money was for and whether you know the, the club would owe it back to them. But the thing is at the end of the day it was not enough because um, Palermo was not able to, uh, well, number one, get promoted, but they weren't even able to, to go into the playoffs because of these outstanding the debts that still sat um, in their laps. And ironically, Zamparini, even though he was not directly involved, he was still behind the scenes. And I think this is what led to some promising leads to actually some American businessmen, uh, uh, businessmen um, not buying the club. And this would have brought significant investment into the club, but it was because um, Zamparini wanted to still be somewhat in the picture. So after the, the British folks left the, the, the picture, it turned into the infamous Tutolomondo brothers who are travel agents in right. Sicily and they bought the club 
And it was an even bigger circus when they took over than even when the British uh, folks had this. Was this and the so, name of, uh, was it that, I can't remember the name exactly. Was it Arcas Group or something like that? So, Were they so a little bit Arcus, brothers? No, no. So Arcus um, was them, and it was the Tutolomondo brothers, and it was like two other individuals who were related. There was one who was more Italian American, and well, not Italian American, he was proper Italian. And what they were doing was similar to what the British people were doing. So they were looking to make a profit by hoping that the club would get promoted, number one. And then number two, being able to turn around and say, hey, look, we can sell this Serie A club mm. and, you know, make a quick profit and, and, and step out of the picture. Well, when Palermo did not get promoted from Serie B, yeah. the next season they had to register. And the Tutto okay. Lo Mondo brothers did not register the club in time. Or it was, fill well, out the proper. One minute or something after the, the deadline. So, <laughs> yeah, so they had to pay like a thousand euro registration fee. And on top of that, yes, you have to file proper paperwork in time. And this is where the infamous fax machines come into play. And when they missed the deadline, they blamed it on a fax machine in. Um, I'm not even kidding. Yeah. This one was like, it was a fax machine yeah. in. Yeah. Lith Lithuania or something, oh, right. Bulgaria, something ridiculous. That was like, wh what are you talking about? I don't understand how this is even a thing, but this is what happened. And so, yeah, it was clear. It was clear they had no money, and it was clear that they were nothing but fraudsters. And, um, and yeah, right. And so that's when the the club really did go belly up. And so, at the time. Um, uh, uh, the mayor, uh, Orlando, took over and said, look, you can, uh, uh, we're opening up the rights to own the club here for whoever gives the best pitch. And yeah. there were four, maybe five serious or somewhat serious candidates, but this is where Dario Miri came back into the, the picture. Um, he had a portfolio. He had um, a three-year plan for what this club would be, how it would start back out from Serie D into Serie B. And his idea was he's going to get them to Serie B, but then recognizes that he needs more um, financial backing than he has at hand uh, to, to go any further than that. So he's willing to sell the club or at least have, you know, even a majority investor uh, come into the front. So no surprise, he won that, that auction. And Anthony, really, in, in, in all honesty, what Palermo was able to do in the 2019-2020 season, Serie D season, was pretty incredible. Because yeah, of it is. It's when, not easy when, to go when, in there. No, and, and, and it's, even, it's made even more impressive in the fact that this club came together in – less than a month from having no players, no training camp, no staff, to being able to put together a squad that then rattled off 10 straight wins in Serie D. And then obviously with, with COVID and whatnot, but they, get, they end up getting promoted. And they had the most points of all 166 clubs in Serie D at the time of yeah. uh, play being stopped. And so it was deserved. And, um, you know, here we are now in Serie C. Um, a couple of years in, it's a, it's another unruly beast, but um, yeah, this takes us back to present day. And I mean, in that Serie D season, uh, you know, yet yeah, we're in Group I, the likes of uh, HR Messina were in there. We talk about a new formed FC Messina side that wouldn't have been easy at that time, Savoia, who were just creeping up on news. And I mean, COVID kind of stopped. I mean, Palermo, when COVID hit, I think that's when Palermo had like a little bad spell, like losses it to did. Arthur, Savoia. So, I mean, kind of in that respect, it, it was good that they got promoted. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, it was a little fortuitous too. I yeah. mean, you know, it, it was a good squad. And I mean, the likes of, you know, up top, um, oh, who was that striker, the, the lengthy striker? Just uh, struggling to find his name. 
Lorenzo uh, Luca. And no, that was in Serie G. In Serie D. Um, in Serie D, we had uh, Sforzini. Sforzini and the other one. Was, I can't remember the other one. Um, had, not. He had the uh, okay. beard and curly hair and. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, um, uh, that is. He's he's a legend in Serie D. Yeah, he is. They, and he's you good sign player. him. All right, hold on. I will find this out real quick. Uh, I, yeah, I'm struggling to find the name. I know who he is. I'm just struggling to find the name because he's uh, he scored uh, all yeah. the time. Yes. Yeah. It was Giovanni. Um, Giovanni Ricciardo, that's his yeah, name. Yeah, Ricciardo, yes. there we go. He yes, was, yes, he was yes, yes. He was four years. And, um, right. And yeah, and then that was uh, really good. And you, you came back up and you went to Serie C. And we talk about last season in Serie C, how difficult it was. You know, the likes of Ternana, they just destroyed everyone in their path. And that's what made it difficult. And, you know, you yeah. have Ardi in there and... Uh, the likes of Avellino, Monopoly, who's yeah. creeping up on everyone. Um, right. I mean, Catania, too. Like, you have some very traditional oh, I think powerhouses Catania, in there. I think Catania has the same fight as probably Palermo at the end of the season here. Uh, I think Catania, I think there's no other avenue but bankruptcy here. I, I cannot see how this club is going to survive anymore. In Serie yeah. B, let alone compete to, for Serie B, because we're talking about you were just mentioning how Palermo uh, with 40 million in debt, Catania is, I think, sitting on 65 million euros in debt. And yeah, I mean, Joe Dacobina, he was the last hope, and somehow CG, they failed to uh, clear a bit of debt before he came in and didn't meet the agreements. And here we are, Catania. If it wasn't for that 800,000 euros Takopina donated and some other holding companies just donating some generous amount of uh, funds, Cadania, uh, I, I couldn't have seen how they would have even... I think they could have been inactive this season as well. So Right, right. And, yeah. and unfortunately, I, Anthony, I think you're right. I think that is going to be the path here. And the other thing is, you know, having gone through it, it's like one of those things where you're like, wow, come on, somebody has to come, or, come along. 40 million is not that much. 65 million, sure, it's not that, not that much. But the reality is it will be easier to reform a club, start fresh with no debt, than take a club like that. And that was just, it was a tough pill to swallow, uh, even when you're in Serie B. Yeah. Um, maybe it's a little easier in Serie C, uh, but you know we we know that Serie D is it's a tough competition. I okay. think though, a club like Catania, just like Palermo, has a name recognition that can draw talent to it and make the stay there, um, you know, not long. And 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 if that is the case, that's the case. But you know, let's look at it from a realistic lens. I think this is going to be um, the future for a lot of clubs now in this post uh, pandemic yeah, um, type of financial climate. And so, you know, it, this just makes it even more imperative that these clubs start to be more well run financially looking at balancing the books i mean now we're looking at what's going on in syria ah, with the in inflated numbers and whatnot but yeah, um, exactly. you know it, yeah it's one of those things where even now people can be frustrated with our current owner uh dario miri and i see it on the message boards and, and yeah. in the comments or whatnot because they're expecting a Maurizio zamparini type in investment when the reality is that's not how you can operate in this day and age. No. And also with, you know, um, where we're at. And so the, the, the good news for a club like Palermo is, yes, look, we're not in first place, but we are competitive. We lost Lorenzo Luca last year, but we, we have been yeah, able to, to yeah, but we've been able to, replace him um you have, yeah but not just with one player like i mean you have Ronaldo, right right but yes you have but... 
you have other names like Soleri who can be reliable. I mean, Fella this season, he hasn't been the same um, type of player like you could say at his days like Monopoly or Avellino, but he, he's still present. And then Floriano is kind of like, oh, I'll come in as an impact, you know, type of player. Right, right. But right. It, the way th- things are, are you happy with Palermo so far this season? Sure, you got to be. So they look more balanced this season, don't they? Yeah. So I'll say this: when when Palermo signed Oscalia last season yeah. to coach the the club, I was over the moon because I thought there was no better coach there. Um, with a uh, yes yes with a track record and especially a track record in 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 Sicily like Toscaglia has when he was at Trapani Um, unfortunately whether it was the fact that his tactics weren't weren't coming through or maybe just how the squad was assembled wasn't the the greatest but the point is the results on the pitch were not happening and so when they moved to his assistant I was like, well, this is just a money-saving move, sure, but yeah. maybe you give a little jolt to the club. Because let's face it, Filippi, he, he doesn't have any sort of pedigree um, no, for, no, no, for no, all intents and purposes. Yeah. yeah, he's been, um, you know, Bascaglia's right-hand man for a long time. He's been an assistant. But even starting last year when he took over, there was a jolt. All of a sudden there was an identity yeah. Uh, identity and and even in the playoffs they played very well. Oh, and I thought they, they were going to pull off something more spectacular. They, than they got. It, mm. and, and really, the only reason why they didn't was injuries because yeah. Luca was not available. They had a couple others that that just you know look we were missing bodies and, and, and he only they had, I think against that that goal rule. Oh, I mean that yes, playoff yep. Rule when the playoff yeah, rule where it's just yeah the higher team, when you draw the higher team on the regular table bit, i mean like yeah right right I mean, you, you have to be and proud so, of the way they played there at the end yeah yes absolutely and so going into this season you were like okay let's see what felipe can do let's see who yeah. we bring in for 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 player replacements and and i think the strategy has been very sound in look can we find the next luca Maybe, maybe not, but let's diversify the approach. Harder, but <laughs> right? Yeah, right. And so um, bringing in a guy like Brunori, um, bringing in Fella, who is coming on now. His last four or five matches, he, he has been perfect. scoring and he's looked much better than, but I agree, at the beginning of the season, he was just, look, we brought him in. You're excited about somebody with pedigree joining and then the performances were, were a little flat. But what you're seeing from, from Filippi is identity, a little bit of mental toughness as well, cool. and the ability to adapt. And I think you know, we saw it even in, in, in tonight's match with the fact that, look, he might have gotten a couple players wrong in terms of his starting lineup, but he yeah. adjusted really quickly. And by the 60th minute, we were already four subs in but it ended up being uh, the, the, the difference maker there, and they come away with uh, a crucial three points. He also has been looking at utilizing the different um, characteristics that these players have. So Brunori is that, that pacey forward who can run, make those runs, and, awesome. and pretty much be helpful all over. Yes. Is, and yeah, then you have... Dynamism. Yeah. Right. And then you have a young kid like Soleri, who is more of your prima punta, that, that person who you're going to send crosses in. And, and honestly, he, for being such a young, young kid, he's done a very admirable job of, I mean, he's got three or four goals already on the season. They're yeah. all coming in as, as, um, as, as sub appearances. And so now the key here is we're coming up on, you know, Three huge games. You can count tonight's game as, I mean, as it, one. Monopoly, you should have a, a little bit of extra confidence now. I mean, to beat Monopoly, uh, Monopoly it's uh, not easy. And no, because they've been hanging around uh, knee body as well. I mean, it's a very good result. Right. Yeah. right. And so and so you I have them, obviously. The, the derby now. Huh? So the derby is always a 
game within the game, right? It no, doesn't matter no. what it, – it does not no, matter no, what the no. – um, right, right. And so, I mean, I've always loved these, these derbies. They've gotten very heated in the past. I think what we have seen, as, as, as silly as this sounds, but since both clubs have been in City of Chi and given – probably the global temperature as well as you know the financial climate at both clubs i think there's been a little bit more of endearingness between the two sides where it is a rivalry but even the fan bases i mean we saw a couple of weeks ago there was some really bad flooding in, in catania and um Palermo supporters and and even uh, the club itself reached out and provided some yeah, support. Some of the players to... went to Catania to help out with some of the cleaning. I mean, which is a really nice thing you want to see. Right, and it is. And I think it gets past, you know, some of the explosiveness that we saw in, in oh. the late 2000s and, yeah. and when both clubs were in Serie A. And, you know, as great as that was, there were some very serious um, um, incidents as a result. So, yeah. you know, uh, on the one hand, it's it's always great to see these two clubs go at it. It's the most important derby in in, in, in Sicily. Chile. So, yeah. yep, it, it is. It's the it's it's. It's actually it's a derby game. that has it, it, that could be like a city a blockbuster. In all honesty, right? Absolutely, and, and, that's and where even then, right, these clubs need to aim for you know. And right, right, and and that's how it was back then too. I mean, that it yeah. was very much like that. Um, you know, I think that, you know, that being said, um, I expect it to be very tough. I'm not going to think that you know, even getting three points is a given because, um, regardless of of the form from from each club, they they both get up for this game, and I think that, you know, Catania itself. Despite all the chaos outside of of um, the dressing room, so to speak, yeah, they played very well. And Attacking wise, I think they have been phenomenal. Like defensively this season, I mean, yeah, they're one of the worst defenses. But with Luca Moro up top, and you got players hanging off him like uh, Rossini, and that I, I've been really impressed. Yeah. I mean, uh, they lost to Latina. Um, this weekend, which I, it's kind of weird how they didn't even score in that match, but at Serie it Chico, happens, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, at Palermo against Picerno last yeah, year, I mean, it was the same thing. You're like, I don't understand how this is yeah. happening, but I just you just hope Barty loses against Avellino uh, tomorrow, right? Uh, right, um, but and it's then that's a big game for, in Catania, it is a big game, and you know, um, I'm just really keen to are you scared of model how he's going to go up against the Palermo because Palermo's defense has been better this season you have to say more, it, a bit more it, structured it has it, it definitely has in fact they're the key to their success over the last five six matches their form has been their defense yeah. and um, and this is another kudos to Filippi because at the beginning of the year the the, the, the back line was dealing with a lot of injuries Injury. and so yeah. there was um, like Crivello was outside of the squad heading into the season. Like they were trying to sell him yeah. because he did not fit the characteristics or he seemed superfluous to what Felipe wanted. Two and a half, three weeks ago, they brought him back in. And look, I mean, he subbed in uh, again tonight. He's been making regular appearances. And this is like, this is what they've had to deal with in terms of a little bit of adversity this season, but it's also a huge um, uh, boon of confidence when you can get those results with, you know, any sort of pairing in your back okay. line, whether you're doing a back three or a back four, um, you know, getting somebody like Andrea Cardi back um, after he's been out all season with a long injury okay. layoff. Um, it, it's, it's really good to see. And then, you know, you have to give, um, a shout out to Pelagotti between the sticks because he is, um, he, he really is what you need at, at this yeah, level. Um, um, you know, that type of leadership, that veteran leadership. And he still is making some, um, he's saving points for this he club uh, week is. in and week out. No, so, so yeah, it's, it's going to be really intriguing. Yeah, Moro up against that kind of like 
a reform yeah. a lot of my defense and yeah, I just want to see how Cardano's defense holds up uh, against, you know, Brunori. I mean, it's going to be a fascinating battle. And because, you know, last season, you know, there was a lot of expectation that Cardano would beat Palermo because obviously Cardano had better form last year. Right. But right. we saw in the derby twice. I mean, Palermo, they had to, I think they fielded less. I think it was like one. That, that first. Less, that COVID-19 <laughs> breakout. and. Right, the first uh, they, derby. They, it was a one-all result. Uh, a controversial goal for Catania there at the end. But then Palermo goes but to... I, yeah, go ahead. I, I think it was that match. So, so here we are talking about the derby, right? Yeah. And it was that particular match where the results up until that game had been very disappointing. Idiocre. Yeah. And it was in that match where... We had nobody. We had no bench. We had the Primavera goalkeeper as our twelfth person. Uh, he was the only person on the bench, and the performance that they put in Andrea Saraniti, who, you know, I had a lot of questions when we signed him to try to lead this line. And yeah, they were proven to be honest going forward. But in that match, he got his first goal, and it was one of those things where. It, pro- it, it provided the spark for the club to go on a little bit of a run um, after yeah. that derby. So it was that togetherness that came about. <clears throat> right, right. And right. then Palermo, they go to Gadania and they win 1 0 through that amazing Santana goal. Um, right. And that was a game where you were playing with 10 men, I think, pretty much the whole match. A, right. I don't know who got sent off in early. In the first half, but again, Cadania, you know, managed to lose the derby like that with the expectations that are, that are high. But yeah. I wonder this season now because Cadania, they're playing with more freedom. There isn't this expectation to pretty much do anything. So I wonder how it's going to go now. So but, yeah, uh, and, and the other thing I would say is that has been one of the uh, dark spots on. Palermo both this year and last year is their discipline at times yeah. getting re- you know reckless challenges but also just careless sending offs yeah it's been and, a this year. Know, I don't know uh which game it was that had so many cards towards the end it was a game that was I think last month or so but I just can't remember the team who they're playing whether if it was Avelino or someone like that and there was just so many cards like four red cards or something like that in Insane, right? Right, right. I mean, if um, I mean, you know, Palermo, if they if they beat Cadania here, and then you go back home and you beat Bari, I think you have a really good shot. I think in at least maybe breathing down the necks of Bari for a little while, and then if because I think Bari this this season they've been impressive at times, but they have hiccups in them. They have hiccups, right. and like right. every team does in Serie C. So I think, you know, if Palermo can bounce on those, you know, I mean, pounce on those things, um, you know, Serie B promotion automatic. I think the best shot for Palermo is getting automatic spot right, to Serie B. Playoffs <laughs> can be a really grueling process, as we've seen in the past, so... I mean, you know, I think this is a really good shot for Lerma have this season. I honestly right. do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Anthony, you know, it, it just gets harder, right? Especially for an, an, an owner who is admittedly of somewhat modest finances. Yeah. And so, you know, he's very realistic about that. And um, yeah, you, you want to go the direct promotion route because... Yeah. The playoffs in Serie C are insane. It is an insane exactly. process. Yeah, Danya, it is just they they had like five or six years of it. The prom- like they never they always just missed out on that direct promotion, and so you go to the playoffs, and then it just comes right till the end. They always lost by uh, an away goal or right. You know, and there was one season where I think Catania were supposed to go to Serie B because there was a couple of clubs in Serie B that. We're going bankrupt. 
And so Cavania was one of the higher teams uh, through the playoffs that was supposed to be promoted. And there we go. Serie B decides, oh, we're not going to play with 20 teams. We're going to play with 18 teams this season. So uh, a little bit of a a conspiracy there, maybe. But, um, yeah, so I think Palermo, uh, the good shot you have this season is uh, automatic um, promotion. And, I mean, you know, wasn't there talks with, I don't know if, what the talks are like now, but um, with the Sampdoria owner, he was kind of interested. So he Fer- was Fer- one of the... Wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, Ferrero was one of the ones who actually, when I talked about them submitting um, bids oh, back in the pre Serie yeah. D, yeah, he was one of those. Now, he has come back and he tr- is trying I'm to... Interested show an interest but Anthony I'm going to be honest here this is a Zamparini-esque situation because Ferrero himself has debts and so what he is looking to do right now is he does not want to leave the world of football he doesn't want to do that but he does not have the money to keep running a Serie A club with all of the debts that he has and so, so how big is the debt years, with Sampdoria, you reckon? So it's, it's, it's a little different because there's club debt and then there is some outside the club right. debt okay. in his personal sphere. Right. And um, I feel like it's only a matter of time before that shoe drops. And I feel like his seeming urgency here to both sell Sampdoria and he keeps coming around Palermo knocking on the door is a way for him to say, look, uh, time's running out for me before I get caught here. Yeah. And so um, I don't want him. <laughs> I do yeah. not want him no, to want Palermo. You want to things of the past. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, you know, I think in Italy we need a little better auditing, financial auditing uh, oh, to begin yeah. with. But, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, yeah, I would prefer it not to be him. Now, in the last couple of weeks, uh, Miri has talked about some other potential investors coming in. And okay. I think he alluded to uh, another British group. There are no names, but I think there has been meetings. Right. And the difference is when, when Miri says this, I tend to give it credence instead of like Zamparini used to say this all the time. He had an Arab investor ready, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, yeah. this was always smoke, uh, smoke, and there was never any fire. Um, when, when Miri says this, I think he's, he's, he's legit telling the truth. I think, once again, it's a matter of being palatable to an investor. And it becomes a lot easier if your club is in the second tier of Italian football than the third tier or the fourth tier. And so maybe it is a wait and see, maybe not, but um, yeah, they, he still is actively seeking in, in investors. Yeah. I mean, you look at Jay Takopina and, he, and he tried, he's gotten spelled now, but I just right. wonder why he didn't, like, it didn't work out with Cadania, but why didn't he at least try for something with Palermo, you reckon? Because I mean, maybe. It could have worked out with Cadania. So I, I think he had tr- he had tried in the past. He had been a, yeah. in those circles. I think with Joe, um, mm. I think with Joe, how do I put this? I think he is a guy who likes to talk a lot of game and right. show an interest, but at the end of the day. Um, He's not always committed to long term that final line. Yeah, long term commitment or whatnot. And we've seen this now in his ventures uh, with other clubs, but also, I mean, he is a figure in the realm of football investing. And what I mean by that is he has been kind of a broker between interested parties, a lot of times from the States to clubs in 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 italy and so he will bring these parties together 
maybe it's during these processes where it says, hey, you know what, I'll go in with you or whatnot. I don't know. I don't profess to know. But that is what I have seen. Now, if you look at the Roma situation, uh, him and Palotta have had their back and forth yes, plenty of times yeah. where, you know, they, they accuse each other of whatnot. But um, I think this was another situation where, you know, Tacopina with Catania, with Palermo, it was, let me throw my hat in the ring, see if there's an in here. But yeah. I'm not ready to make that full commitment here because of, and, there, and, and a lot of times it's valid circumstances, right? Like, look, yeah. I'm not going to take on this massive debt when there's no guarantee that we can even stay up in this division yeah. uh, or even move to the next division. Why would I do that? If I want to start a club, I'll start it from scratch, not worry about all that and, and build it how I want to build it. Yeah. I mean, we so said, yeah, he, he did incredibly well. I mean, and they, they have stabilized now and they're, they're in Serie A. And, but, um, yeah, with Cadania, it's just mind-blowing to know that, you know, uh, it was so close, the takeover. And then when he said in the initial, I think the, the initial contract signing, he said nothing's like official yet and there's still more paperwork and uh, other like debt to be cleared out. So I was like, oh, is it really going to happen? Like, is it just too good to be true? Like, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And it's and it, right. And I think um, that's how I've, treated a lot of uh, uh, that type of information. Now, here's another fun little anecdote. Back when I ran my website, um, Ultra Palermo, and back when um, that Twitter account was in its he heyday, yeah. I had a lot of Palermo fans who were quasi-celebrities kind of step out into the woodwork. One of them being Mike Piazza. He's a famous um, American baseball player. He was a Hall of Famer or a Hall of Fame catcher. Yeah. He apparently was a Palermo fan. And part of it was his roots, his Sicilian roots, his, his, yeah. his ancestry there. He even wrote a, uh, a, a blog, a, a post for, for my website, basically okay. talking about his fandom and whatnot. Now, it was this interest that was like, hey, Mike, I think you should buy this club, right? And you would yeah. always hope for this type of investment. Now, at the time, they were still a city of ah club, and he didn't have that kind of money to really put forward. Yeah. But what we have seen, though, was I think through Taco Pina, he did manage to come across and buy a club in Italy. And that experience left him with a, well, a very bitter taste in his mouth because of a lot of the fun Italian bureaucracy or bureaucratic yeah. issues that he ended up running into. So I think, you know, again, it's, it's difficult to, it's always difficult to invest in a club that you know is not going to be profitable right away. Number one, number two, the way the Italian system is set up for this stuff yeah. also failure. And so a lot of the success stories have to happen when, you own everything, including the stadium where you play. Yes. And so until some of those rules ease up where they make it easier on that, I, I, I don't think that we're going to see a return to, um, you know, calcio heyday that we saw, you know, in the 90s. Yeah. So there is a lot of, you know, a lot of that that needs to happen. And, I think that's another reason why it's it's harder to invest in in these mid level or mid these lower division uh, uh, clubs uh, yeah. across the across the space. Yeah. I mean, with, with um, a lot more where you are now, like, are you um, where do you see the future going here? Like, just say if you get promoted this season, what do you reckon happens? You know, if you go, so, to B? so I think in Syria B the opportunities are better. And I think that would be a welcome relief for current ownership because that is something that, look, they came, they came with a plan. That plan was willingly limited or willingly acknowledged their own limitations into how far they could take this club or run this club. Yeah. 
what they didn't plan for and what nobody could have planned for was the pandemic and that you know kind of crushing uh some of those plans now the good news is they have been able to balance their books and minimize losses i think that is a tremendous relief but the reality is the window of opportunity is relatively short so if they don't make it to Syria b this year they might have one more shot before something has to happen yeah new investment either has to happen or palermo will have to be willing to be a mid table Syria c yeah. side and that's something that nobody wants because it, we've lived through that for 20 plus years yeah so that i mean you're right anthony in the sense that the the urgency is now this is a, a win now type of situation the club as it is is constructed in terms of players this season is a lot better than what it was last season oh, i think they finally have some key role players and some key coverage especially in the midfield and speaking of former Catania players. Oh, yeah, I mean, Dalolio. Yeah. Yeah, Dalolio is a, is a great signing for, yes, he has. you know, yeah, for this midfield and he's for its ambitions. He's kind of, he's kind of giving you that extra, I don't know, playmaker's role. I mean. Right, right, and right. And he's versatile. He, he can play oh, yeah, all absolutely. across that, that midfield. So, um, it's going to be key. He's experience before with Brescia as well, so. Um, right. He's kind of yeah, he's he's good in the the Serie the A because he's got that kind of experience. But you know, Luperini, he's been you know good from time to time. Um, yeah, and, and, and last other, year the other player, I think it's De, De Rose. De Rose, no? De Rose, yeah, he's no, a, he's, 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 he's a, a thing. phenomenal. He's a real piston. Yeah, he okay. is a thirty-four-year-old who is running around like he's twenty-four because. Oh, okay. He seems to be tireless, that guy, and he has yeah. been he has been crucial the last season and a half in terms of, you know, not having things come, fall completely apart. No. So no, so yeah, it's a, you would say the urgency is there, um, and the window is very short. So um well that's what makes it, you know, interesting to see how yeah, they go for sure. see, see if they can you know, hold on with Barty and see who takes it. But um yeah, it's going to be very, um, how would you say, it's, it's going to be a nervous uh, rest of the season here. And we'll see how you navigate, you know, through this December schedule because it's a hard one. Um, but I, I really hope, you know, and this is coming from, you know, a person with Gadania roots, I really hope Aladmo gets promoted. I want him going back to Serie B. Uh, there needs to be in a Sicilian team back in the top two divisions in Italy. I mean, you know, they have to go. I, I, I mean, I would agree. It, it yeah. is Sicilian representation in uh, both Serie B, sure, but going back to Serie A, I mean, that is that that should be the norm. Just because we look at a lot of uh, of the factors, but just you know, um, Serie A was always better when a Sicilian club was there representing it. And it was even better when two of those clubs, yeah. Palermo and Catania, were both there. That is what, um, you know, ideally even I would want to because I think it just, the, the representation matters. Um, and, and not only that, I think those fan bases deserve it. So, um, Especially because they're, they're two, you know, I mean, we look at Palermo and Catania and – they're two quite, you know, big, decent cities in Italy that I think deserve to be, you know, at a high level. And uh, as you said before, Serie B, it's probably a, a, a tad easier to set goals in there than, to, you know, in Serie A. I mean, right. we're talking how many? 62 teams or 60 teams in Serie C, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, it's... it's, it's it's a lot and it, you know, and you, so, it really it, it really it really emphasizes itself when you get to those playoffs and you look at that bracket and you're like wait what how does this even work yeah 
And trying to explain to somebody who doesn't understand how that playoff system works is always entertaining because it's like, well, okay, so you have three divisions in Serie C. They're all made up of roughly 20 teams. Some of them have more, some of them have less. And the playoffs, who makes the playoffs? Okay, well, it could be the second to uh, the eighth or ninth or 10th place team in each division, depending on, you know, points and, and whatnot. And so... And people are like, wait, what? You're yeah. like, yes. All right, exactly. So I mean, you got it. I think it's only in Italy too, like out of the top five uh, European nations, you look at, I mean, England and Spain and Germany, their third divisions don't have like groups. It's just one group with like 24 teams or 20 teams. And that's, I think, the way it should be. It might avoid all these things like, oh, this Serie C team went bankrupt. Here we go, back to Serie C. And probably there needs to be a reform in there and it might be a bit better. But, I mean, you know, it's Italy, so it's probably going to take an eternity to happen. Um, But, you know, um, it's... uh, Yeah, I just hope um, we, we get these Sicilian teams back. And, you know, I think... I hope Catania, I think they need to go bankrupt. I think that's going to be the best thing that will happen to them. I think forget about the the um, the thing, you know, they haven't been bankrupt before. I think we have to get over that and just restart right. fresh. Right. I, I want to be cleared of debts and, uh, you know, starting fresh from there. But we'll see how it pans out for the rest of the season. And, yeah, we'll, we'll hope for the best. But what are your predictions for the, the Sicilian derby? What do you think is going to happen? I think it'll be a draw. You think a draw? I really High yeah, scoring I really draw? draw. Three-all, two-all, maybe? <laughs> One-one. One. Yes, one-all. Yeah. We'll see. yeah I, I'm going to guess an early goal and then, um, and then a late goal. So, I think always drama. Goal. I think he's got a goal to him, obviously, for this game. Oh, for sure. Maybe Brunotti to get some here, or we'll see. Maybe, or or maybe somebody from the midfield uh, <laughs> finding a, a goal here for Palermo. Yeah, Dalolio so. maybe getting a goal. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that would, would be, be something, right? Yeah, that really but, would be. No, that's it. No, but it was good to have you on the show, Lorenzo. I think um, it was pretty much today. talked about. Yeah, pretty much all that I wanted to to get from you. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, or something like that? Have any other? No. Yeah. Um, no, n- nothing like that. Other than um, you know, keep keep doing this work, Anthony. I think it is. It's pretty cool, and yeah, it's thanks. it's niche, but it is a a good niche to be in. Yeah, in, and like, um, that, that's you know, why I'm really urging. Like, if if Sicilian teams were back in Serie B or Serie A, I think the coverage would just get even. It, it right, and that was no more niche anymore. So yeah, right. That was all. That was always at the back of my mind. Palermo during their heyday. It was Zamparini always talked about having these Arab investors, and you think of a Man City uh, at the time, or um, you know some of these other oil run clubs. And yeah. at the back of my mind, I was like, wow, if he was, if he's telling the truth about this, and he ends up selling this club to some very rich investors, and Palermo goes from this this club that was kind of nothing to a Manchester City. Yeah. Wow. Look, I've I've beaten the curve, so to speak, or I'm ahead of the curve here. Obviously, that never happened, but um, in reality, it was it was never a burden. It was always, you know, probably like for you too. I mean, this is a passion because yeah. you know you are. You have roots there, but also you are a Catania supporter. So it makes sense. Um, anything that comes as a result of that is gold. Um, and so keep doing what you're doing. Um, you. I'll try to promote you when I can. Although yeah, I, have to get I, I think you more you're, often. I, I have to get you more often uh, on podcasts and that. And, uh, I think and, and this was a very, yeah, this was a very, th- this was a great introductory session. I'm, Glad I got to, to meet you here, Anthony. Yeah. Um, I could be a lot more sarcastic and um, uh, crack a lot more jokes here when 
uh, when the time is right. So it's cool though. Hey, look, I give you a a little breakdown. You you get my history. I got your history. And, um, um, you know, the, the edits, like those edits that is, that's not just you doing them, is it? Yeah. It's all me. Just me. Man, that is incredible. Yeah. Okay. That's, that is super kudos there. All right. Because that is some tremendous work. Anthony, to be dedicated to being able to do that. And then I would imagine being able to turn those over so quickly because like, I get it. I had to come up with a logo for um, my website at the time. And I ended up doing it where I actually had a buddy and I explained what I was looking for and they were able to get that. But then I had to build my website from scratch and I didn't have that HTML type background, but it was those things that, you know, eventually you put in that dedication and hey, it leads to, um, um, man, Anthony, because of your dedication to that, I think it's, it's also that eye to detail that is going to set you apart from, from um, anybody else. So yeah, keep doing that, man. It's, it's good stuff. Oh, it really is. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's on the way up and um We'll see how it goes. I mean, obviously no one in the English language does that type of thing, which is kind of cool. Not even in Sicily too. I mean, they do have bits here and there, but, you know, not to the extent. But then I found you and you're like full on Palermo and you're in the US. And I was like, well, you know, not even in Palermo that that dedicated to. (laughs) It's uh, it's insane. And um, we'll have to get more collaborations going. Um, I mean... Anthony, it goes even like I can spend hours with you telling how how nuts that passion is. I mean, um, playing. I, I grew up playing. You know, played in college um, or university, I should say. Yeah. I at the club level. So post college, we created a club out here called US Palermo. So right. I live and okay. breathe this stuff. So so here's the interesting thing. You know Sicilians in their passion, even when they have emigrated outside of the island. Yeah. You said it yourself being in Australia. You said you're in the Sydney area. I'm sure there's a Sicilian community um, where you're, where, oh, where you're from. There's plenty of Sicilians around, yeah. So I'll tell you a quick story and then I'll let you go. But um, my family emigrated from Aspra, right? right. And it was my grandfather who came over on the boat post-World War II. Right. In Aspra, there are two little streets. I mean, calling them a street, you know how it is. It's not yeah, really yeah. a street. It's whatever. Um, there are two streets that have been renamed to the two places in the U.S. where the majority of residents of Aspra emigrated to. One of them is called Via San Diego. Okay. And the other is called Via Milwaukee. Huh. I'm in Milwaukee. So Milwaukee is about an hour uh, north of Chicago. So I'm, I'm in Chicago, right. Yes. So the, the thing is, the crazy thing about Milwaukee is if you run into an Italian here in Milwaukee, there's a very strong Italian community here. Right. But in reality, a lot of them are Sicilian. They're not even Italian. And they've all came over from, well, Aspra, Porticello, um, uh, and a couple other, you know, of those little towns. Okay. In so Sicily. Palermo, so, province, uh, yeah, more, 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 yeah. yeah, I would say definitely in the Milwaukee area. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get people from, you know, the Catania region yeah. or, or Messina, and we have that. But the Italian community, I would say, is largely Sicilian. So uh, that just gives you a little picture as to um, maybe some of the fandom or some of the psychosis on my part. But, uh, you know, the other thing is having the family still over there and going back every year is, an, is another big component there. The final thing I'll say is, under normal times. My uncle is from Porticello. He came over when he was 17. My father and my uncle and myself, when my uncle couldn't make it, we've been leading tours 
of Sicily exclusively for the last 15, 16, 17 years. Okay. And um, we take members from my father's work. He, he, you know, he worked at a social club. He works at a, a golf club right now. Um, but take members there on a trip solely of the island. And then on one of the final nights, what makes this experience unique other than being just a Sicily, Sicily trip is we'll take them into one of our relatives' houses for a meal, like a seven-course yeah, meal, and that, yeah. yeah, that usually is like the, the 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 toast or the highlight of the trip. And so, so you've been yeah, so you've been doing that, and uh, you've been doing regular trips to Italy. But how has it been now with the pandemic? So we have not been um, since 2019. Yeah, um, sure. We have two on the docket. Um, potentially here for 2022. Yep. So we have one tentatively set up for the end of April and then uh, another for October in 2022. Um, so, you know, hopefully if things start to get better and we start to get, you know, out yeah. of this a little more, we can resume those. But yeah, they, they would go pretty much every year since I want to say like 2003. Two thousand four, because America is probably closer to Sicily than it is. Like Australia is like pretty much the other side of the world. So, right, um, right. There, there is a bit more flexibility over there. But um, yeah, it's amazing, and you know, it's amazing just to see a Palermo fan. You know, uh, with that American accent, it's it's pretty cool. So. <laughs> it's probably wild, yeah, <laughs> for um, sure. Yeah, but Lorenzo, it's been a pleasure to to have you on and um, Same. we'll have to do uh, more in the future, definitely. All right, I'll save. I, I, I've got so many more stories to tell you. Next time I'll tell you about when I snuck into uh, Lorenzo Barbera uh, posing as a steward to, to, to watch a match. So uh, that'll be next time. I will All definitely right? do that. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Lorenzo, uh, pleasure, all right? All right. And, uh, good luck in time. the derby, all right? Same. Forza Catania. Veniamo. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right, ciao. All right, ciao.